Well, how are you? This is an exciting class, women, women in business and women success. It's a privilege for me to be here. As Anne mentioned, I'm Director of Business Development from Utah Community Credit Union. I've been there almost eight years. Uh, my boss is here, Mr. Norton, who is one of my dearest friends. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Ugh. I was about to say the year I was born. I kind of don't want to, but it was in the 50s of 1950s. But, um, and uh, it was very cold. And, but I was born into an Irish-Italian family, predominantly Italian. My mom was born and raised in Wichita. My dad grew up in Buffalo. And how random that my father would meet my mother, except that he went into the Air Force after he graduated from Georgetown with a business degree. And he, went to he was stationed at McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, Kansas, where my mother was. And my mother could definitely stop traffic. <laughs> and my dad was in his very wonderful 57 Chevy and saw my mother with her girlfriends pulling into a burger place. And uh, this is a funny story. He kept asking her for her name, and she wouldn't, she wouldn't give it to him. And then finally, they were t he realized they were seniors in high school. He said, well, do you have seen your pictures? Well, long story short, he found her driver's license and saw the name Moore, Patricia Moore. Called every Moore in the phone book the next day and said, I'm so grateful your grandfather's name started with G, because he was George, because if I had to go all the way to Z, I'd have been there a long time. So they were married, and uh, they settled in Buffalo. And um, in 2011, my family, we had a business that celebrated 100 years, and we are a family uh, food distributorship. We're currently now in, I think, about 25 states located out of Buffalo, New York. But with that being said, it was started by my great-grandfather in 1911. And as I said, we celebrated our 100th anniversary in 2011. I never knew my great-grandfather. He died in 1929. But I knew my grandfather and my father very, very well. I was the oldest grandchild of anyone. And um, they were very devout Catholics. And they observed Catholicism combined with business, which started me off on a very good path. And that was that faith, and for me and my family, a belief in God and understanding that our Creator has blessed us with, with many things, that we shouldn't be all about business. We need to be about bus running a business, but we need to be about the employees, and we need to be about our customers, and we need to be about God. And so just to, to illustrate, uh, the Friday before Easter of every year, uh, the company was named Trippy Foods. It is named Trippy Foods. It's now run by my brothers. And my maiden name was Trippy. And um, on the Friday before Easter, it was closed every noon to 3 p.m. in observance to the time that our Savior was on the cross and was dying for three hours but was also atoning for our sins. So we were always closed on that day. And we observed other holidays like St. Joseph's Day, um, not really St. Patrick's Day, but ones that were more pious, obviously Christmas and those types of things. So I was raised with this. But I was also the oldest child in my family. And my dad, he was building the business. And so in the 60s, when I was still little, he would travel all throughout western and central New York to call on customers to make sure they were doing OK, but also to find new customers. And he would take us children along. And I never really knew the amazing learning opportunity that I was given. I was sitting in very small mom and pop grocery stores, but I would watch my dad as he would talk to people. My father was very polished. So was my mother. And he would meet with these people that owned just a tiny grocery store on a corner. And he treated them as though they were the king or queen of England. And always took a very humble approach to speaking to them and making them feel like they were the most important people on the earth. And really, they were, because they kept the, fam the family business running. They kept people employed. And so I got to learn a lot of that. One day, I was driving with my dad, and we came across a very large, yes, is it the beads? Can you uh, pull your hair? Sure, you house? bet. Sorry about that. <laughs> OK. <gasps> I forgot about the mic. Um, we drove past a very busy crowded baseball field. And I remember my dad saying, gosh, wouldn't you just love to be one of them? And I said, what do you mean? 
He said, I'd love to be able to pull up a chair at four or five, six o'clock and watch my children play ball. But I have over 200 employees that I'm responsible for. And I have to work and think about them every breathing minute. And I only saw my father cry two times in his life. And one of those times, the first time I ever saw him was Christmas Eve. He was crying like a child and he was on the phone and I was probably 12 or 13. And there was a man who was delivering groceries to a store. And it was in um, Watertown, Waterloo, Waterloo, New York. And they had a huge steep hill. And the winters are very unforgiving in western New York. And he hit the hill and he slid into the home of a family on his way home to his own family. And the driver was killed and four people in the home were killed. And it was so devastating. It was so devastating to the entire company, not only because we had to bury an employee, but we also had to, had to observe and attend everything for this family two days after Christmas. So along with business and responsibilities, you can choose not to care or you can choose to care. And the only way you care is by doing. So my, my dad and my mother wanted me to have a really good high school education, so they sent me to a college preparatory girls' high school. It sounds a lot nicer than it was. <laughs> there were no boys. And um, I had been a cheerleader starting in fifth grade and in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade for Tyro, you know, the little 105-pounders, 125-pounders. 130 pounders, and I really loved cheerleading. So it was a good outlet for me and a good recreational thing for me as well. My dad started a, a printing business with us children when I was in second grade and I was the oldest. And we printed signs every single week for all of these grocery stores throughout Western New York. And he made me the president. And I remember trying to sign checks when I was in third grade. And I would not make it out to the right person. He'd be like, no, no, no. I was like, oh my gosh, check writing is just the worst thing. I still have problems with it today. But um, at any rate, that existed until I went off to college. And we worked five days a week, me and my brothers and sisters printing sign in our attics. So it was, that also ta taught us how to work. So my recreational time wasn't very, it was very limited. So cheerleading was very important to me. So I had school, printing, and cheerleading. When I went to this all-girl high school, I had made the public school freshman cheerleading squad and how do you cheer for all girls? And I, this was really upsetting to me because they had a cheerleading team at Narden Academy, but they cheered for girls. And I just thought, well, that is just, I'm never doing that. But down the street was an all-boys school named Canisius High School, run by Jesuit priests. And Narden was run by the Daughters of the Immaculate Heart, all very Catholic, very wonderful. And um, my dad went to Canisius. Uh, in, he graduated in 1952. And I said, Dad, they have boy cheerleaders at Canisius. I'm, I'm, I'm leading somewhere with all of this. I'm 13 years old. And he said, Karen, how badly do you want to cheer for Canisius? And I said, well, badly. And he said, well, you're going to have to do something about that then. You're going to have to go see the athletic director. And I said, would you go with me? I didn't even have a driver's license. He said, I'll go with you. Well, we went and we met with Connie Mack, and he said, I think that's a very good idea, but we're going to open it up to the 12 all-girls schools in Buffalo. I was like, no, can't we just limit it to Narden, please? And now we're going to open it up. Well, anyways, we, we broke an 83-year tradition, and we started girls cheering there, and they still do it today. And I had no idea the power that that I had, that you have, that we have, that if we can think it, we can create it. And I remembered at the time, of course, going to a Catholic high school, we, I had a religion class, and we were reading about Jeremiah. And so this is when my freshman year, and Jeremiah was, in the Old Testament, was 13 years old. And the Lord had called him, our creator, my creator, I don't wish to, of course, my affiliation on anyone. But my creator approached Jeremiah, appeared to Jeremiah when Jeremiah was only 12 or 13. And he said, yes, but I am but a lad. And I remember thinking, 
at 13 and learning about Jeremiah, well, wait a minute. If God has that much faith in me and in young people, then I must have that type of faith in myself. So it was very interesting that we were able to, to, to break this 83-year tradition with the help of my dad, but it taught me that I can do things. I can do hard things. I can do scary things. We all can. We can make a difference. And so I went on to college in Rochester, New York, and uh, was getting my biz uh, manage managerial degree in business. And I met my husband at that time. I had worked all these years. I had worked at Trippy Foods. I had had a printing business. By the time I graduated, I was 21. And Mike had been asking me to get married since I was a sophomore. And I was bound and determined I would not marry before I had the sheepskin, before I had my diploma. There was no way. That was the one thing, that was the one thing I was going to do for myself, was to get my education before I thought about taking care of someone else or bringing children into the world. So I did, and we graduated two months later. How about if I take off these? Well, this is just. It's, it's not the program. It's the okay. Sorry about that. Well, maybe. Should I move it into the center? It's okay. Okay. At any rate, um, we married and moved to Syracuse. I had worked three jobs to help put my husband through law school. And we just had this wonderful, great life. And I had had my first daughter. And um, I was in a grocery store called Wegmans, named Wegmans, which is like. That's my happy place on earth, and they don't have it out here. Trust me, I've written them many times to say, uh, you guys are really missing the mark because there are more children and more families in Utah than probably five states combined. I don't know why you don't move here. Well, at any rate, I was shopping, and this photographer stopped me, and he said, did you ever think about modeling? And I said, no. You know, modeling just wasn't my world. And my dad, who was very staunch Italian, I had an opportunity to join the Ford agency when I was 18. And I had been spotted in college by a photographer at Kodak, which was based out of Rochester, New York. And my father said, I can't repeat what my father said, <laughs> um, but my dad said, I am not turning you over to that market. He said, I didn't raise you to be the woman that you are to be to have you get into this certain type of market. He says, you get, your, you get your degree, you go on, you get married, you do whatever you want, and then you can do what you want. So this photographer stopped me. And he said, would you, did you ever think of it? And I'm like, no. And um, he said, well, there's a, a, a Mrs. New York pageant that's, not that I want to focus on this, I really don't, but I entered it. And there were about 85 contestants, and I was first runner up. And I was so devastated because I'm competitive. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Oh. I came that close. Well. Four months later, the girl was disqualified. And being first runner-up, I got to fill out her term. But by this time, I was already pregnant with my daughter. I was just a couple of months, my second daughter. But I was able to go to the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and all that good stuff. But what it did was it opened doors for me. All of a sudden, some people in the Syracuse area, which was very high-tech, like Rochester, New York. It's not, it's not New York City, but you have a lot of high-tech companies there, got me. Um, an agent saw me and said, would you think about doing this? I said, well, I'm having a baby. Long story short, I got into it a year later. And so with that, I was working for Kodak, for Xerox, as just that fun girl that was just showing you this very wonderful new product. I was Carol Merrill from Let's Make a Deal, <laughs> you know, um, but not into the whole sexy end of anything, you know, not doing runway, although I did some bridal shows, but um, got into Bristol Myers Squibb, Xerox, Kodak, Bausch & Lomb, IBM, and there were also, I wasn't a member of SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, so people would farm out from Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, to get people that they wouldn't have to pay residuals to. I signed a release today. All I had to do was sign a release. They could use it over and over and over again. Carrier, I remember there was a big billboard all throughout Mexico, and I couldn't see it. Uh, because I wasn't in Mexico for carrier air conditioning. One of the big, two of the big coups were, but they weren't very glamorous. But I did a Chevy commercial during a Super Bowl in 1992 and also showed up in People magazine. My mother, and my dad had died. My mother had moved back to Wichita. And so she'd never really seen my work. And I'm like, I'm in People magazine, Mom. 
And so, you know, that was kind of fun for her to open that up in Wichita. But um, as uh, life would have it, you know, I was very Catholic. To me, personally, there were some holes in Catholicism. I didn't understand why rules were always changing. When you went to church in 1964, you were, women were always veiled, um, perpetually putting a piece of Kleenex over their head because they would forget the veil. And uh, you know, <laughs> it was done in Latin. Um, there is a story, but I can't tell it because I'm on camera, but it's hysterical. But at any rate, we'll just, it didn't involve me, but it involved one of my girlfriends. But at any rate, I had to have something on your head. And you don't pay a nickel to get it in the bathroom. So at any rate, I'll go that far with it. Um, at any rate, um, we moved, I was living in Syracuse. I had a really nice life. We had a very comfortable country club, you know, fancy cars, nice homes, you name it. My husband was an attorney. And two young men came to my door in Syracuse, and they were with uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I was just like, nah, I don't want to know anything. But they, it was very warm. It was very hot out. And I had made cookies or something. And I said, why don't you come in? Just to, because they were in suits and it was so hot. It was unseasonably warm in Ju this particular June. And um, they came in. And after eight weeks, these two young men turned me upside down on my head. And because God has always been a very important part of my life, my family's life, what I had learned was it filled in all the holes to some serious questions that I had. Um, and I joined the LDS faith. Consequently, my husband on the day of my baptism of 16 years, my college sweetheart said, if you join this church, I will leave you. Doing the right thing will usually be the hard thing. Staying true to yourself and your integrity, whether it's personally or in business, can be a hard thing to do unless you start developing habits and realize that you won't be compromised. Well, my husband left, and it was very difficult. And I, I, and I tell you this story for a reason, because my whole identity and who I was was wrapped up very much in my husband and in his career and things that he did. Well, now, I had no one. I had moved away from my family three hours, 120 miles away, 150 miles away. And um, from this very posh country club life to standing in a church food line with my electricity shut off. And I was so devastated that uh, my agent would call for certain jobs for me to do, and I, I wasn't able to do them because I was just so broken. I could barely get up and get dressed. And uh, I, I started going to church at my new church, and um, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about snobbery. It taught me a lot about um, facades. It taught me about how real I really wasn't and how I had kind of adopted this whole life of being this woman on television, this woman in the news, uh, well, not in the news, but in commercials, and um, not having to worry about money, having nice clothes, everything pretty much designer, shopping at all the right places, box seats at all the events, having all the right friends, and what I didn't know about what I'm supposed to be doing here on this earth was a lot. And I had to get out of my own way. And my divorce took three years because my husband was an attorney. And uh, I was very, very, very poor. And uh, he decided to run it through Supreme Court where you cannot get any sort of assistance. If you'd run it through family court, I could have started with assistance, but your settlement typically wouldn't be fair. So I hung in there. and. Um, my children ended up joining the same faith I did, the LDS faith. And then my divorce came through, and I came out here to research a little bit more about some family roots and met a man <laughs> out here 
who was of the same faith I was. And I had been divorced now for two and a half years and uh, moved myself and my family out here. Well, I had three children and um, married this man that was the man of my dreams. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give up this whole life of radio and television because now I'm 41. And, you know, there comes a time when you know you should be put out to pasture and you should be looking for something else instead of trying to hang on to what you shouldn't be hanging on to because there's a time and a season for everything. And I have learned from the time I was young, constantly reinvent yourself, constantly look for new adventures and new challenges. Make sure, though, that before you make that decision or you give your answer, that it sits in here. When it feels right, it is right. When you have consternation, concerns, um, a lot of questions, and it's just not sitting well, that is a very good message. This is not the road you should be going down. You need to build your intuition. You need to build, you need to pay attention to how you feel around others. More importantly, how they make you feel. Because it's going to sep separate you from what is good and what isn't good. But if it feels right, if it really feels right, and it stays compatible with your integrity, do it. No matter how many naysayers there are or how many people tell you no. Because you were built to do things. You were built to create things. You were built to believe in yourself. You were built by a king. Well, if you were built and created by a king, what does that make you? That makes you royalty. You have to understand your self-worth. You have to understand how important you are to be born to the United States, if indeed this is where you came from, or anywhere, but you're here now. And the difference that you can make. You're not going to be forced to make, but you can. So I came out here, was married, and um, <laughs> things just sometimes aren't what they seem. And uh, I thought I was going to be going down a whole different path with my new husband and his four children and mine, and they all lived with us, and they all called me mom. And uh, after four years, he was going down one road, and I was going down another. And while we were only one degree apart in our thinking and in our beliefs, had I stayed, it would have been an entire enormous chasm by now. And I saw it, and I, I left. But fortunately, I had another little boy um, named Jacob, who's now 13. And so he was a very great thing, and I have my, I still am very close to all of my children. But when I came out here, guess what happened? Well, I'm not, I probably could have been hired to freelance in advertising and television and radio, which I'm good at. But it, I needed a consistent full time job. When I was married to my husband, who was the attorney, I freelanced. So I could work five days a week, or I could work one day a week. That wasn't going to pay my bills out here in Utah. And I knew no one out here except for my sister. So I started a business and went to a company called Corporate Alliance, which is similar to the Chamber of Commerce. And I went in to join. And, they were, and the two owners, this was in 2000, no, 1999? My father died in 1999, so it was, it was 2000. And so I had met the two owners and wanted to join, and they were asking me why I wanted to join. Well, something very magical happened. And when they told me I could join, they asked if they could hire me. And all I thought was, oh, I don't care what you're going to pay me, but I have health care. I have health care. You know what? I have health care. And so I said, you bet. And um, was probably making enough money to feed a church mouse but I had health care. And I was validated. This is something you need to remember about every single human being on the planet. They need, they want, but more importantly, they need two things. They need to be loved, and they need to be validated. And Brad knows these things. You're the greatest guy on the planet. Um, Kim Basinger, 
who was Alec Baldwin's first wife. I have loved since I was in college. She said something. She had terrible stage fright. Most of you wouldn't know that. When she won the Academy Award, she could barely speak. And if you could, she was like this. She did not know how to be in front of people until one day she had this epiphany and she said, everyone is still a seventh grader in a lunchroom. And that clicked in my head. So I have to go into businesses. I have to meet people that are unknown, people that are well-known, people that are millionaires, people that are rubbing two nickels together. And sometimes it's very intimidating. When you're a director of business development, I have to go out and I have to open doors that aren't open yet. And sometimes I'm still in the car going, oh, go slow in the driveway, just go slow in the driveway. You know, I'm like Rain Man. Like, I can't, I, you know, how am I going to do this? And um, I remember, everybody's still a seventh grader in a lunchroom. So if you go back to when you were a seventh grader in a lunchroom, what did you really want? What did you really need? You wanted to be accepted. You wanted to sit at a table with someone to eat your lunch. And when, some, when you come along and you love people, and you validate them, and you let them know how important they really are, it makes all the difference in the world. It turns you to serving instead of taking. It makes you, it, it trains you to think about them and get the focus off of yourself. So Corporate Alliance, I started there, and I had, was a director of uh, business relationships. Um, I didn't know how to do that. I was many years away from my degree, but I had confidence in myself. And sometimes that's all it takes. You can have all the letters after your name, all the degrees that you want, but if you don't believe in who you are, if you don't start to train yourself to know who you are, you're going nowhere fast. And you're not genuine. You're not the real deal. You're the real deal when you stand in front of somebody and you want to create a win-win when you want to serve them. And by serving them, you serve others. Working at a credit union with over 100,000 members, I get to, Brad gets to serve our members every single day and serve our community. The credit union motto is people serving people. Well, you better not be working there if you don't have that in your head and if you don't believe it. So I stayed with Corporate Alliance and um, I was there for five years. And then in 2006, an opportunity at BYU Athletics came up. Oh boy, are you kidding me? <laughs> BYU, this Catholic girl that went to Catholic grammar school, high school, college, married in a big Catholic church with a big Catholic wedding, and now I'm going to work at BYU. <laughs> I'm hoping nobody's rolling over in their grave. And so um, I was hired on to sell sports properties. When you walk into the stadium and you see signage, no matter how big or small, you want to go into a bathroom and you see signage, that is called a property. And I was able to sell this. And um, it was a very compelling, exciting, um, all about you kind of job. Because everybody wants to be your friend now. And, and to sell BYU, that, pro that property, BYU sells itself. I just had to be vertical and show up <laughs> with a contract. Um, there's two things I want to tell you about that. Everybody would sign it. You got the all sport pass. And the funny thing is guys are going, what's your job? What are you doing? Who do you know? We have an all sport pass? Yeah. Oh, can you get me down on the field? Can you do this? Can you do that? And I'm down on the field. I left my north end zone seats, my four seats, to now have an all sport pass. And boy, aren't I somebody else. And I'm meeting Delta. Carl's Jr., Sprint, you name it. All these big companies that are huge sponsors, Allstate. And I am courting them. So I, don't, I not only have a 40-hour-a-week job, but I have to go to every game and court all these high-end sponsors. Well, aren't I something else? And you know, you're on the center court. Brad remembers I was presenting the game ball to UCCU, to my future boss and to the director of marketing. And, you know, the game's sold out. There's 25,000 people, and it's all about me. Here I am. Aren't I great? Well, something happened to me. One night I had a dream, and I was standing in the middle of the football field, and a voice from the left side of my head said, Wow, you could never go back to your north end zone seats. 
You could never leave such a job of visibility and such notoriety. I was like, no, I just never could go back to those seats, ever. This voice said, then continue to pursue your vain ambitions. And I sat straight up, true story, sat straight up in bed. And I handed in my two-week notice the next day. And the reason was, my son was six years old. I was now a single mother, and he was always with a sitter. And I'm not taking all these other people with me when I leave. I can try, but I will leave out the most important relationships that there are. Well, I handed in my two-week notice, and Brad happened to call me. About a week later, a couple days, it was, it, was just, it was just so magical. And he says, how are you liking your job? Because they had outsourced to ISP Sports. So that means BYU no longer housed the sporting properties. They sold it for a very hefty price every year in a con on a contract. And so I was no longer working for BYU. I was working for ISP. How do you like your new job? I'm like, well, I, I, I don't. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be staying here. I'm, I'm leaving. And he says, we have a job, a position we haven't been able to fill. And I'd known Brad at that time for about six years. And he said, would you come and interview? And I said, you bet. And I went in and I got the job. And now, well, sometimes we work 40 hours, but a lot of times we work 60. Um, but I'm one mile from my home, less than I'm half a mile from my home, two miles from my son's junior high school. All my children are older and married, but I'm doing the right thing. You work at a credit union. I'm a woman in Utah County. I am not going to be a Rockefeller. I'm not ever going to see the kind of money that my children's father, Mike, makes and has multiple homes in different areas and travels all over. And oh, trust me, there's times I'm just like, <laughs> you know, but I'm plodding through it, one step in front of the other, and I am surrounded by the greatest people on the planet. My boss has gone through many, many things with me, but we have a very well congealed department because we also have a man that is a man of God and who does the right thing, who has wonderful integrity, and I work with people that have the same. We are all like-minded. We are serving. We are serving our children, our spouses, our families, our community. And it's one thing to say that you're Utah Community Credit Union. It's another to be a force in the community and to say, we are people helping people. A bank is owned, is a, is a for-profit and is owned by stockholders. A credit union is not for-profit and is owned by whom? You, its members. They make the decisions. So while we're not lining the stockholders' pockets, the paid stockholders, we are taking our profits and transcending them into the highest yields possible and the lowest rates that there can be. And every single day I get paid to go out and forge relationships, strengthen current relationships, and to represent the credit union. I remember somebody asking for the credit union's business a couple of years ago and came in to meet with me. And he had someone else with him. And I looked at him, and he was in jeans. I'm like, man, oh, man. <laughs> You're asking for my business, and you showed up in a polo shirt and jeans? Uh-uh. Because that says you have no respect for me. It doesn't matter how much respect you have for yourself when you're asking for someone else's business. My father, on every single Saturday, he worked six days a week. Everybody in our family did. We were very Italian, and Sundays were great days. But every Saturday, my dad came home from work. He would go in about 8 o'clock on Saturday mornings, come home about 2, 3 o'clock. We would be printing signs and almost finishing. He always went upstairs to take a shower. And he would come down in a pair of wool pants, and a button-down shirt, a sweater, if it was winter. And one day I asked him, I said, 
when you don't have to work, why do you, why do you come home from work and shower? And he says, because every Sunday morning, I go to see God, and I shower, and I put a suit on, and a tie, and I go to church. My family is just as important to me as God is. I will come home from work, and I will shower, because every Saturday night was family night. And my dad was dressed because he had respect for himself, but he had respect for his six children and his wife. We'd be going nowhere, dressed up, nowhere to go. And, uh, but we were together. And I remember I used to hate family night on Saturday nights, hated it. Because this was, this, was, this was the night that all the proms were and everything else. And, and I was a cheerleader. I mean, I could go to the games, but I had to come home right afterwards. But most of the games were Friday night. And I used to just say, couldn't we just like change it? Couldn't we, couldn't we move it to like a Wednesday? And he's like, you guys won't like this now, but you'll thank me later. And my dad's been gone for, well, since 1999. And I've moved out here. I'm not away from a lot of my siblings. But we're like this. Sometimes my family's very odd, and I'm sure they think I'm odd. Um, I couldn't choose who I wanted to be born into. I can choose my friends. And sometimes I'm just like, ooh, you know, why did I have to be born into this family? But along with that, there was a lot of great things. And so I've been working at the credit union, as I said, seven and a half years. And um, one day at the, and it's very interesting. Remember what I told you about in here? If you follow what's in here, you're going towards your destiny. And, and everything is in sync. Because when you respect yourself, and you do the right things, you're happy. You smile a lot. There's tough things that happen, don't get me wrong. But you are grounded in a sense of peace. And you know you're doing the right thing, and you know you're helping others. You're not, step, you're not stepping on people's heads to elevate yourself. You can do that, and you will be elevated, but it will not stand long. It might stand decades, a couple decades, three decades, I don't know. You might die with a lot of money. My father died with a Rolls Royce in his, in his driveway. That's just he had to do that because that was something about him and my mother. They had divorced and he just had to have that. But my father couldn't even take his underwear with him when he passed away, could he? And that car had to sit there. And our very big house had to sit there. But what he took with him were the relationships and what was left with us are all the good things that he did. And that's true with anyone. And so one day I'm at work and uh, I've... 2010, so I was divorced for eight years, single, hacking it out in the wilderness. Um, and I went upstairs. I went, I'm, I'm, we're on the second floor of our building in the Riverwoods. I go bounding up to the first floor to ask our CEO a question. And he's in a meeting with some gentlemen. And I see this man. And I'm standing there, and I'm looking at him. And I'm like, who is that? And I look at the, the CEO's assistant, I'm like, oh, who is that guy? And she goes, she goes, but he knows Jeff. And I sat there and I kept looking at him and I'm like, I'm something just stopped me dead in my tracks. When I first saw my husband at a party in college, I saw him and there was a voice, not quite a voice, but an almost equivalent to it, that is your husband, you're gonna marry him. And I remember going, well, he's not very cute. <laughs> like, oh. I don't want to marry him, but three and a half years later, I marry him. Well, I'm, I'm looking at this person, and I'm going, and something says, if he isn't married, you're to date him. Like, he's probably married with eight kids, like everybody out here. <laughs> and so I go downstairs, go back to my office, and I'm running into my, my boss's office. And Brad, I don't know if you remember this, and I'm just like, I don't know who I just met. Who did I just meet? He's like, who? Who are you talking about? And I said, the guy upstairs. Who is he? And he's like, who? I'm like, the guy, the guy, the dark-haired guy, the one in the wheelchair. And he says, Kurt Brinkman? I go, OK. I don't know who he is, but OK. And so I, he goes, and he's a friend of Jeff's. So I call up Jeff, or I call Sean. I go, i got to ask Jeff something. So I get him on speaker, and I hear Jeff's, Jeff's sermon. And I see him. He's like, hello. I go, Jeff, Jeff, who's that guy, Kurt Brinkman? And he's like, well, he's in Pleasant Grove. I go, is he married? And he goes, well, I have no idea, Karen. 
And then Jim Stead, who's our HR guy, all of a sudden I hear another voice and I'm going, where are you? He's like, I'm in a meeting. I'm like, I'm on speakerphone? <laughs> oh my gosh, one of the most unprofessional moments of my life, which I've had many. And um, anyways, find out who he is and reach out to him. But I don't hear from him. So I'm like, that's it. Okay, I'm not doing it anymore. Not going to do it. And I heard a voice say one more time, I don't want to. I'm not slumming. I'm not, I'm not pursuing someone. I'm a woman to be courted. <laughs> and it's like, one more time. Called on a Monday morning, and he picked up the phone. I was like, rats. Ugh. I'm like, hi, Kurt. How are you? Good. Who's this? So I start telling him, and I said, perhaps you'd like to have lunch or something. And he's like, yeah, OK. And so we decide on lunch, April 14th. Never forget it as long as I live, 2010 my grandfather's birthday. April 14th was a very significant day in my life. And I remember getting up that day, and you know how you turn out? when, Like at my age, like I'm turning 55 in like three weeks. You don't turn out, but I turned out this day. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my hair is so good. Oh, it's April 14th. And so I'm waiting. He's going to pick me up. Waiting, 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 12.30, 1 o'clock, I dial his number. He pick, his house phone. He picks up. I'm like, oh, God. Hi, Kurt. Hi, how are you? Um, you know, I'm all right. And he goes, were we supposed to do something today? I'm like, I'm pretty sure I got up at 7 a.m. I'm pretty sure that I picked out my outfit last night and did my hair and everything, and you just spaced it? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, I'm leaving right now. And I'm like, don't bother. He says, no, no, I'm not kidding. He didn't remember who I was, but I remembered him. So. He's like, well, why don't you bring a sandwich over to my house? I go, I don't go to single men's houses. He says, well, my renters are all here. And my family, my daughter's stopping over. And I'm like, all right, fine. And I went over there. And I remember when he opened the door. And he looked at me, and he was like this. <laughs> I'm like, how are you? Long story short, we had lunch. Um, and he wasn't very kind. I remember that. And I just, we, I ate my sandwich in about 20 minutes, and I said, I'm going to leave. I'm leaving now. He goes, why are you going? And I said, because you act like you don't want me here. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, I, 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 he goes, I don't know what to say to you. He goes, I, I don't know how to talk to you. And he goes, will you sit with me for a minute? And so we started a wonderful courtship. Um, this is the man I waited for my whole life. This is the man that I had to go through really hard things to meet. I met him at 50. He had lost his legs when he was 16. He was electrocuted. He had been in a wheelchair for 39 years with no legs. And I just remember crying, say, in 1970, in July, July 6th of 1970, I wish I were here with you. I wish I was with you when this happened, because I know that you're mine. I'm sorry I couldn't go through this with you. But it's OK, you're here now. And it's interesting to learn to live or go date and be with someone who's in a wheelchair. I had three steps going into my house. It might as well have been Everest. One time we were getting out of his van, and, or his Honda Pilot, and I pulled out his wheelchair, and my, I, my house faces north, so there's just nothing but ice all over my driveway. And he gets into it, and we start to slide, and it tips over, and we go down into my cul-de-sac, and I'm laying there, and I'm looking up, just going, man, how, how am I going to get back to my driveway? And we're slipping. The ice is so thick. And I have to just get to snow to get traction, pull him, get in the wheelchair. And we just started laughing. And I just said, oh, our life is an adventure. And so I had wanted to, and I'll get very personal here, I had wanted to be married and sealed in the Lord's temple. Given the LDS faith, this was critical to me. Because had, it had cost me so much to join this particular faith. And Kurt had asked me to marry him. And I said, I'm not going to. I'm marrying the temple. And we were moving in that direction. In September 7th, 
2011, he died of a massive heart attack. And I was actually working at an Alpine School District golf tournament when I found out. And I just remember this teacher looking at me saying, no, he died. Because I was talking about him. I said, we're going to have lunch today. Well, no, he died. And I'm like, no, we're having lunch at 2 o'clock. No, he died. And his family had been trying to reach me since about 7.30, 7 o'clock that morning. But I'd been on a golf course. And so I watched almost every dream I had, every belief I had, go with him, and I had to dig really deep. And I said, I'm worthy of this hard trial. His death is wisdom in our Creator. And I remember Brad going into Brad's office about, I don't know, a couple a week later, two weeks later. I don't know. I was off work for two weeks. I remember that. I remember going into his office, and he said, are we ever going to have our KT back? I said, I don't know. But I'm back. And Brad, do I dare? OK, but I'm back. And I know where he is. And even though he's been gone three years, Sometimes it feels like last week. But I know where he is. And I know that he's waiting for me. And I've been single for 12 years, and it's not a day at the beach. But every day I get up, and I get dressed, and I get to work. It's a privilege to work. I have gone from a beautiful home as a child to marrying an attorney, doing all the right things that I thought were all the right things, and to watching it go through my fingers. Then to having to start over, and then having to start over again. Then having to start over again. But we become indomitable. We become strong. I don't want to bury a child. Um, but I can do hard things. And I can serve with that knowledge. I can serve others and say, I know how you feel. My first husband was a prolific cheater. And I couldn't leave him because I wasn't going to break up my family. But then one of my choices, the one choice I make, he's like, I'm not doing it. I'm like, tell your story walking. I've done everything for you. This is the one thing I'm asking. Why would you ever interfere with someone's most personal relationship on earth, and that is with whom you believe created you? Why would you ever? And I remember the girl calling me that he had cheated with and he was married to. <laughs> my phone rang. I'm like, hi, Sarah. She was a nice person to my children. She's sobbing. Mike's been having an affair. Really? I'm so sorry. I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> Let me see if I can talk you back into that window ledge that you're on the 87th floor and you're ready to jump. And, but I can, I can do these things. I can talk about these things. And life is to be embraced. And all that happens to those that love the Lord is for their good. So whatever we categorize as a hard thing, a brutal thing, a great thing, a joyous thing, they're all for our good. And you know what? Life is, what is happy? Is life happy? Is it great to work all the time and carve out some familial moments from your two-week vacation or whatever it is? No, I don't, happy isn't it. It's just this is our moment to shine. You see pictures being taken of Kate Middleton and the whole royal family and everything else, and people on the red carpet, and you know, getting Emmys and Academy Awards. Guess what? You're on the red carpet because you're all princesses. You're all able to become queens. 
And everybody that's died before you is looking at you going, come on, this is your moment. This is when you shine. This is when you become the hands of God and make things happen, no matter what the vehicle is. I have a wonderful vehicle with Utah Community Credit Union. I can make a difference. We are serving over 110,000 people. I would never have met Annie if I wasn't working at UCCU and we didn't have such an integral partnership. I wouldn't be here in front of you. And let me, let me tell you what a privilege it is to be here in front of you, to be able to talk and tell my story. Maybe you thought it was all about business, but it's about everything. It's about the first day your, your oldest child can tie their shoe. Or if you're not married and you don't have children, my Achilles heel is relationships, marital relationships. They just don't work for me. Doesn't mean they might not, but they don't work for me. But everything else does. So I'll put whatever attention I need to that, but put it even more attention to what works and what is good. I want you to believe in yourselves if you remember one thing from today. If you don't know who you are, I do. And if you don't know who you are, God does. And you're doing all the right things to build your resume, to build your life, and to build your futures. I applaud you for that. Because by all of you sitting in here means you had to leave some place to start over and come here. And it's not easy. But it is enjoyable, it is fun, and it is worth it. And I got one more thing. Why don't we leave this life with an A plus instead of a C minus? Just because there's white driven snow in front of you doesn't mean you don't put your footprints in it because nobody else has. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>
He's like, this is the greatest thing. And I'm like, well, we try. But it's not just to get you in the door. We want you to trust us and be confident to stay in the house. Because we're not here to make money off of you. We are here to help everyone become successful. Yeah, we have to get paid, but it's still a credit union. And so that's, that's what I do. And I have to trust and believe that every person I'm in front of, if I've got integrity, if I have passion and a belief in what I'm doing, the next time that something comes to their mind about, huh, I need an auto loan, or oh, I need a car. Remember that, remember that woman? You'll never remember my name, but you'll remember UCCU. That's why we do what we do. It's a very good question. Excuse me. <coughs> Yes. You said you had older children that were married. I'm just curious if you had any grandchildren. I have four. I have four. And people say grandchildren are better than children. No, they're not. <laughs> Your children are where the sun rises and where the sun sets. But I marvel at my grandchildren. I have four. Two girls, two boys. I have. I have. Well, I've been lucky enough to get. Um, I look at them and just the little things they do my posterity. You're going to be a grandma, Leah, who's two. You're going to be a grandma one day. And your granddaughter, you're going to look at your granddaughter and you're going to just marvel at the whole cycle of life. And it's just so beautiful and they're so fun. And I look at them and I'm like, oh my gosh, my blood courses through your veins. My daddies, my mothers, my nannies, who was my grandma, my papas, my gammy, my gampy. We just, we keep going, and we're doing things right. There was an abusive cycle back in some of my family, but we've managed to turn it around and get it right. And so there's never a better time to be alive than the time you've been given to be alive. Do everything with it. Anybody else? Yes. It is. It takes time. What is the one thing that you feel like you always were able to fall back on or to draw from to give you the strength to come back? It's a great question. When Kurt died, I, I was waiting to get KO'd. I was waiting to be knocked completely down. And I felt I was on the crest of a wave and I was being carried and I'm waiting, and I'm still waiting for it to crash into shore. And it never has. And I believe it comes from something innate. And what I, you're asking me, I'm going to tell you personally. We are part of the two-thirds that came from a pre-mortal realm and fought for what was right and we were able to come here. This is a privilege to be here. But we're not dropped on our heads and have to do it alone. But learning who I was, learning who I am, learning that I have, that my creator is counting on me every day and that he will never leave me not one second and he never has, that is what has gotten me up in the book of Job. I've read the book of Job and I'm like, he set the curve. You know like when you took a test and everybody failed, well, he got the A? Well, then you still ended up with a D. And so, and part of me is just like, all hard things are backhanded compliments. They really are. It's telling you how strong you are. God can't come down here and sit across from us and say, Karen, you're so awesome, you're so great, you did this, 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 and this. No, but how he tells us is by the things that are really hard and those pockets that are really joyful, they're fleeting, but they're when your eyes smile and you haven't had your eyes smile in years or you haven't had a hearty belly laugh in years. It's those moments. 
A Christmas morning never for me ever has been on December 25th. A Christmas morning for me was one August day in 2003 when my daughter Heather, who was 16 and good at it, maybe she was closer to 20, goes, Mom, and I'm like, here it comes. What does she want? I'm like, what? And I remember stirring pasta. I'll never forget it. Making dinner for 6,000 people. And she comes up and she just put her arm around my waist and she goes, I love you. I'm like, wow, this is Christmas. That's Christmas. It's those moments that are ingrained in me more than the hard moments. I remember my daughter, the same daughter, Heather. She was pregnant with her first baby. And she called me. She was 25 weeks. She's like, Mom, I'm bleeding. I'm like, no, you're not. She's like, yeah, I am. I'm like, no, 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 that's not good. Not good. It's just not good. It's not good. And she was 25. Or she was 25 weeks. And I remember thinking, okay, if you take her, if you take this baby, you're going to take this baby. But I've been doing everything I possibly can to do what's right. Doesn't mean I don't do things wrong. But I'm trying to always do the right thing. So if this baby's to be taken, then that's the right thing. He wasn't. And it stopped miraculously. And little Logan was born. And he's now five. Very good question. I wish I had a more sound answer. But I think that once you learn who you are, and that you're a daughter of deity, and that you matter, every tear you cry is caught by a savior and your creator, and it's not in vain. Once you realize that, there's really no bad news. People get killed. Man, I'm thinking about the CEO of Morley Builders in California coming back from Haley, Idaho, serving on a board for the, cons the Idaho Conservatory. And for no reason, his plane veers into a hangar. He's killed. His son's killed. Two other people are killed. And I'm thinking, he's 63 years old. He's a man that's done everything philanthropic. How come he got to die and I didn't? <laughs> but, you know, you think about the people that are left. And those are hard things. But we've got to carry on. We've got to carry on. This whole state was built through blood, sweat, tears, death, trudging, weather, seasons, poor, healthy, unhealthy, very poor, wealthy, but it was built. And there is a commandment. I don't, this is a Catholic commandment, and I'm sure it's another commandment too. Boy, did we have to know all those. Honor your father and your mother. It's not just my earthly parents. It's my heavenly ones. I want to honor them. I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want everybody, my ancestors that came from Ireland and came from Italian, Italy, when they could never see their moms or dads anymore, started over here so that I could have a good life, a better life. I could have a collegiate education. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I want them to be proud of me. And I want their sacrifices to make sense. I want their posterity to be strong. Anybody else? It's a great question. Thinking the opposite of myself is almost poisonous. And I don't, I, I live by faith. I don't know all the answers. But there has to be a reason I'm here. There has to be a reason I'm in Utah. There has to be a reason I was born in Buffalo. There has to be a reason that, I mean, I found in Kurt why my first two marriages didn't work. Look back on things, and you'll see that it's defining you. I remember riding a bike when I was 12 years old, and I was heading straight for a vehicle. There was no way I was going to miss it. And, I'm, and I was on my bike, and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is going to be bad. And I almost felt somebody pick the bike up and turn it. I still have chills. I was like, who did that? 
I mean, there was no way I was missing this car. Who did that? And that was the first time I ever thought, I must be, I must be important. And have you ever had feelings in your life where you think, I'm going to do something important, I don't know what it is? I'm going to do something important, and I don't know what it is? Well, we can guess what it is. It's not going to be what we think, but it will be important, and it will be critical, just by virtue of you being here, just by virtue of you living, breathing shows a lot of who you are because if you read in Revelation, there's one third that didn't even get what you got or I got. And right there, that needs to help define you who you are. You rose your hand up, you wielded your sword, and you said, I want what is good. I want what is right. And this is your gift. We're given many gifts, but what matters is what we do with them. And so you know what? I'd rather look at the glass half full than half empty. I'd rather think that I'm great, because maybe I'm not. And nobody else is really going to think that. That if I'm thinking it, you know what, when I die and I was a loon, then you know what, at least I went through thinking I could accomplish things. And if I was a flake, everybody else knew it except me. So, anybody else? I mean, we just have to be real. You know, I, I mean, if I'm going to look at myself negatively, then why do it? Could you look at yourself next oh, Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much.